Okay, it is recording. Okay, then I'll just um, start it off. Wait, before you do that really quick, is there like a specific way we want to know so you can go on to the next slide? Um, I can just like start talking about the next part. We'll just go by that. Sounds good. Oh man. There we go. Okay, so we are group four and this is our Petco pitch. So to start off, our store outline would consist of four main sections and that would be animals for purchase, cat adoptions, grooming, and products. So just to give that a perspective and space, the cat adoptions would be 150 square feet. It would be in the back left corner of the store. There'd be 250 square feet for fish, 200 for reptiles, 200 for small mammals, and then also 200 for birds. Those would all be against the right wall of the store. And then grooming would be 300 square feet. So the reason of having all the animals on the right side of the store and then having the cats in the back left corner would allow for predator and prey animals to be separated and get rid of that overstimulation and anxiety that could occur. So for the store overview, we have the site. So vision, it'd be really great to have a separate entrance for grooming. That way people and animals don't have to go through the main store before going to grooming, which could allow for overstimulation and it could be stressful overall for both parties. It'd be great to also add in clear shelving in the eye line of people. So about four feet and above. So this could allow for visitors to see into the next aisle and predict interactions that are about to occur, specifically if they have a pet with them. So this would be really great for socialization purposes to allow for someone to be able to tell when they're about to socialize their pet with someone new. For the lighting, we decided on a white bright light for product areas around 5,800 lumens. So this would allow for products for sale to be easily read. But then in the areas with animals, we have decided on a yellow around 800 lumen light. So this way it would decrease the stress, especially for animals that struggle with fluorescent lighting like birds. Um, this could make them feel a lot more comfortable in their habitats. For sounds similar to the water section in the, or the water sounds in the fish section of the pet cow here, there could be a calm, peaceful sound in the areas with animals as well. And then it'd be also great to switch to a walkie talkie system when possible, interacting with other employees as opposed to an intercom. Um, but obviously sometimes an intercom would have to be used and it would be great to have a soothing warning noise ahead of time before just having it go ahead and start talking. For smells, um, we want to avoid harsh smells that could harm olfactory receptors in animals and even people. So it'd be great to have the store still smell clean without smelling like it's masking a different scent that's going on. So for visitors to the store, um, we want a separation between animals and products. So that would mean a gate that could give you a good prediction on when you are about to walk into a section that does have animals in it. So this could allow for better supervision when people have children or pets with them. And it allows visitors to know when it may be time to monitor others with a third party a little bit more closely. Along with this, we would also like high habitats so that children would need adults assistance to see the animals closely. Um, and that can assure that the animals are not going to be disturbed. Along with that, having a double layer of glass would allow for even some tapping to not exactly get through to the animals. For temperature, 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit would allow for visitors to be comfortable and also products wouldn't get too warm. Um, but obviously the animals would all have different natural behaviors and needs. So those would all be independently controlled based on their needs. Um, and as said before, the lighting would be bright for products and then dim for animals. So that allows for the products to be correctly purchased. Moving on to the grooming section. It'd be great to add some dividers in between tables. So this could decrease the distractions and also injuries from other animals being excited or even aggressive towards different animals that are also being groomed. So this would decrease the injuries of the animal trying to see someone else, but also it could decrease the injuries in groomers that are trying to restrain a difficult animal. Um, another great addition would be one-way windows so that people can still see in, so you still have that transparency but the animals can't see out and get distracted by other people and animals in the store. 
um, adding mats onto the tables would allow for more stability and less anxiety about falling. Some animals have a little bit of trouble having the metal that's slippery. And it could also allow for comfort if they're padded, especially in pets that do have arthritis and struggle with standing for a long period of time. Um, these could be thin and rubber, and it would be easily cleaned and disinfected between each pet. It would also be great to have more assistance available and having extra groomers available to help with restraint, especially for a difficult animal, instead of having one person try to restrain them while grooming, and that overall just protects everyone from getting hurt. For the cleaning, there should be a UV closet for smocks and aprons. This way we can disinfect from any types of pathogens without degrading the material over time from harsh chemicals. And for cleaning the animals, having a blow dryer at 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit would ensure that they still get the job done without overheating the animal. For the cage style system, it'd be great to have run style without having anything on top of the animals so that they feel a lot more comfortable moving and playing. Um, having foam padded mats would allow for them to be clean between animal, animals, but still providing comfort to each animal there. Um, and they need room to play, rest, and eat within these um, cage systems. Um, having a cat cage that has windows to allow for them to see, see outside and sunbathe would also be great. It'd be a great idea to incorporate some items from home for comfort. So for the cat adoption section, it'd be really great to introduce a cat room that's seen at a lot of shelters around here. So that would allow for one wall to be just a window and have some perches there for napping and sunbathing for these cats. And it would also provide the space for several cats to comfortably live together. And that could provide the potential for them to even get adopted together. So this would provide places for napping, playing, eating, and also enough hiding spots for when they get stressed out. So for cleaning of these rooms, litter boxes would need to be cleaned at least once a day and monitored for any changes. Um, all visitors and employees would need to sanitize before and after interacting with each animal to ensure pathogens are not getting passed around. And all towels and beds should be machine washable and cleaned frequently. Along with that, food and water dishes would also need to be washed after use and food and toys should also be cleaned either by UV light or machine washing. Um, since it's not always possible to have cats in the cat room due to reasons like aggression or being too young to vaccinate, or they could even be FIV or FELV positive, um, there, shall, there should still be cages available that are still big enough for natural behaviors. So they should be five feet tall, five feet wide and three feet in depth to allow for playing, jumping and climbing. And this could still offer levels for perching and have distinct sections for each activity. And having these raised off the ground would ensure that the cats are not face to face with potential stressors like kids and dogs if they choose not to be. And this allows them to get high and avoid the stressors. And this could also provide some hiding spots for them to feel more secure. So for cleaning up the cages, there needs to be as much cleaning as possible without stressing out the cat living there, um, but they do need to be cleaned in between cats that are there to avoid the spreading of pathogens. And it would have to be similar cleaning of objects as in the room. For the information card, they need to know supplies, best home, health, interactions, and natural behaviors, especially because a lot of natural behaviors are things that we don't always want to see in cats. It's important that the home understands that things like scratching, hunting, even spraying are completely normal for a cat. Um, ideally, it would be great to have an adoption coordinator on site, and this would ensure that every cat goes to the best possible home. Okay, so, oh. My name is Emma, and I will be presenting the bird section of the store. Um, like Audrey said, um, the birds will be placed kind of with the other animals in the store, the um, bottom right corner. Uh, this corner for the birds is good because they should be placed near windows um, because birds love natural light and it allows them to still kind of be interactive with what's outside. Um, but also we wanna make sure that the birds are away from the door just to avoid any drafts that may occur from the front door. Um, and again, the birds will have about 200 square feet of the store, which is perfect because the birds don't necessarily need as much horizontal space, but they also need a lot of vertical space as well. 
Um, the birds will be cooked with the other animals, like the reptiles, small animals, and fish. And again, the temperature will be about 65 to 75 degrees. Um, we wanna keep the environment of the birds as similar to their natural habitat as possible. And these birds come, all these birds that I will be talking about come from very warm climates. Um, and it is also important to keep the birds away from trafficked, air, trafficked areas because they are sensitive to smells, sounds, and can be easily spooked by people. Um, and so it's good that we have them kind of in a more secure section so they're not gonna be disturbed by people or animals that are passing by. So parakeets specifically, um, they need a large cage both vertically and horizontally. This allows not only room for toys and perches, but also for comfortable space for the parakeets to fly around and exercise their wings. Proper wing exercise for these birds is really important um, because they wanna be able to comfortably fly around without hitting the sides of the cages. And by exercising their wings, we can avoid possible disabilities like arthritis that may occur if they're not flying enough. A recommended cage for a parakeet is 20 inches long by 12 inches deep by 20 inches wide. Um, and parakeets, like all birds, are natural born flyers. So they need to have that freedom of movement to be able to properly exercise their wings. In terms of cage material, um, I personally, caging can be made of either metal bars or plexiglass. Um, both need to have proper ventilation. And if you're gonna use a cage with metal bars, the bars should be placed about a half inch apart. Um, this allows for the birds to have proper ventilation, which is essential for their health. Material should also be transparent because it um, parakeets, like many of the other birds, like to look out and see what's going on around them. Personally, for Petco, I would suggest they use plexiglass um, that has like little gaps in between it to allow for ventilation, but it also stops people from sticking their fingers um, if you are using a bar uh, cage with metal bars, sticking their fingers through the bars and possibly hurting themselves or the birds. Um, in the cage, when keeping in mind the cage, the cage should also be large enough that the parakeets can be housed together because they do like companionship. Um, aspects of the cage that should be added should help with the parakeets' mental and physical health. Um, many perches are necessary. Perches allow for the birds to exercise by jumping up and down from each level. Perches can also help parakeets exercise their feet and keep them in shape. Various toys, is, various toys can be added to to help the parakeets from getting bored. And cuddle bones can also be added to the parakeets cage to help their beaks stay in shape and also keep them entertained. Parakeets are sensitive to sights, sounds, and smells. So um, in this area that we have provided for them, hopefully there will not be a lot of chemicals, gases, or smokes. Exposure to certain things can lead to health issues and possibly death as well. In terms of lighting, parakeets specifically need complete darkness um, in order to get a proper 10 to 12 hours of sleep. So I recommend a cage covering at night, especially if they're by the windows where there might be a lot of um, car headlights that may interrupt or disturb their nights. Cockatiels are very similar to parakeets in terms of they're very social and interactive. Cockatiels need actually even larger cages because they need to accommodate their head crest and their long tail. An optimal cage is about 24 inches wide by 24 inches deep by 30 inches high. Um, by having this large cage, the cockatiels are able to comfortably fly around without hitting the sides of the cage. And again, flying is just as important for these guys as it is for the parakeets. Um, it's important for their mental health so they don't get bored, but also to help keep their wings exercise. And again, like the parakeets, I also suggest the plexiglass with the um, gaps throughout, just allow them to not only have ventilation, but to avoid people sticking their hands through the metal bars and possibly getting bit or hurting the bird. Like parakeets, cockatiels love lots of toys. Um, cockatiels may even need more toys just to help with their mental stimulation. Cockatiels specifically like toys that can be destroyed. So anything from cardboard, non-toxic rawhides, or beads. Um, a bored cockatiel can become very destructive and even annoying. Um, if they are bored, they will start plucking out their own feathers. They can scream and they will even bite. Um, if you wanted to add other aspects to this cage to help them, male cockatiels specifically like mirrors so that they can look at themselves. 
while female cockatiels like nests that they can hide or lay in. Perches are also very important for cockatiels. Um, they like to jump up and down, and again, it helps them exercise their feet. Uh, they should also be kept in an area of the store like that we had designated where there's not going to be a lot of sounds, um, smells, anything like that. Uh, unlike, cockatiel, uh, unlike parakeets, it's not totally necessary that cockatiels have a night covering. Um, they specifically can get something called night terror episodes. So this can happen if something spooks them. Um, so I would suggest having a night light for them at night. Uh, but it, again, if it is near somewhere where there's going to be a lot of car headlights, um, then I would suggest a night covering. Overall, cockatiels are going to need something that's uh, an environment that's relatively calm and quiet to avoid being spooked and getting anxious. Canaries are going to be my third bird that I talk about, and they're going to be a little bit smaller. Um, they don't need as big of a cage. They, um, but also canaries do not like to be housed together. They would prefer to live alone, so you only need a cage that's going to be uh, large enough for one of them. An ideal cage for canary is going to be 18 inches long by 18 inches deep by 24 inches high. The length of a canary's cage is actually more important than the height just because of their specific flight patterns. Again, canaries are also a bird that need to exercise their, wing, their wings um, regularly just for proper mental and physical stimulation. Canaries are not as popular or are not as playful as cockatiels and parakeets, but they do like some toys that they can play with. The toys for canaries can range from swings to bells, mirrors, or even, even leather strips um, that they can use their beaks on. One aspect of canaries that's gonna be different is they love to have a bath. So this is kind of an example at the bottom here of a bath for a canary. Um, they like to be able to have a bath so they can get a quick refreshment whenever they need it. Canaries are also sensitive to sights, sounds, and smells. And a night covering is recommended for them so they can get the appropriate amount of sleep. Canaries can also get easily disturbed by sounds because of their strong sense of hearing. So keeping them in that secure uh, location of the store is really helpful for them to not be disturbed by other animals that are in the store or possibly people as well. So in terms of sanitation, it's gonna be about the same for all of them. It's really important that sanitation is done on a regular basis and there are proper cleaning protocols per, put in place um, to make sure that the birds stay happy and healthy. So cleaning every other day to avoid possible pathogens, bacteria, and diseases. I would recommend when using a cage, getting a cage that has a graded bottom. Um, this is gonna be an easier way to keep the, clean, the cage clean, but also help the Petco employees to clean the cage easily. When cleaning the cage, um, natural cleaners should be used to avoid exposing the birds to chemical fumes. Toys within the cage should be cleaned regularly. And um, another way to help keep the cage clean is to avoid putting the food and water dishes under any perches that might be exposed to bird droppings. And this is just gonna be an example that I would recommend of using um, a sign to put on here. I would really recommend making it colorful and make it really stand out to the people, but also put a lot of information on here that the owner or possible owner should know of beforehand. Hi, I'm Ashley and I'm gonna be talking about the reptiles section. Um, so the reptiles, their square footage is gonna be about 200 square feet. It's gonna be located on the far right side of the building and it's gonna be in between the fish and the small animals. So um, reptiles have like a general enrichment um, so they can get time out of the closures. Um, this should probably be done after the store is closed or before it opens. Um, not all reptiles like to be handled, so it's really important that workers look at the reptiles and look for any stress that they're experiencing and decide based on that if they should be taken out in the enclosures. Another type of enrichment that um, reptiles can get is after cleaning, you can move around their hides or climbing sectors, um, and this allows for the reptile to like explore a new environment, and so an alleged enrichment to their lives based on that. Um, with feeding, a lot of um, reptiles do best when their food is switched up every day. This means like 
for example, if they're in an omnivore, um, one day should be meats and the next day should be like, or if they're more predator, it should be um, like different kind of bugs each day. So to clean their um, enclosures, it is best to spot clean. Um, this means like if they go in the bathroom in one area, um, to clean that up and daily or every other day. And there should be a deep clean of this enclosure about once a month. This means removing all substrate, throwing it out, um, replacing with new, um, sanitizing and wiping down the whole entire glass enclosures. Um, another thing that is really important is handling. This is something that workers should be informed on beforehand. Um, it is really important to wash their hands beforehand. This is a good way to spread disease if they don't. Um, turtles are known to um, very easily spread um, bacteria. Um, when handling a reptile, it is best to touch the back of a reptile, kind of know, um, let them know that you're there and to see what kind of reaction are they willing to be picked up at that time. Um, some like negative things that they might show is they might show their frills or they might start bobbing their head or um, some reptiles will even make like a certain hissing noise. So it's very important to like watch for that. Um, so when picking up a reptiles, they should pick up from underneath the reptile and um, gently move it forward. By doing this, it allows their claws not to get stuck on their environment and where they are. Um, so next I'm talking about signage of the enclosures. Um, it's very important that people know how to pick a reptile up. Like I've said before, they can get injured if they're not handled correctly. Um, and not a lot of people know how to pick up a reptile. This isn't something that people all the time pick up. Um, another thing that scientists should talk about is just about the general species. What kind of species are they looking at? Um, are they gonna be a species that's hard to handle and care for? What their basic diet is. Some people don't like touching dead rats. So is that a good fit for them if their um, diet is a rat? And what kind of, um, what they need to be like prepare for a diet? Like would they need to prepare like leafy greens? Um, it should also include like a tank temperature and humidity. This is very important. Like easily reptiles can get sick or they don't grow right if their temperatures and humidity is not at the right levels. Another thing that should be added is a reptile's lifespan. Some reptiles are your whole life um, that you're going to have to care for them. Are you ready like for that challenge for the buyers? Um, so they got to know what they are getting into. Um, so the first reptile I'm talking going to talk about is the bearded dragon. Um, so the bearded dragon enclosure should be about four foot by two by two, and it should be a glass enclosure. Um, this works best for them. They should have a hide to hide under or crawl on top of, um, as long as other climbing um, structures, which could be rocks or logs, stuff like that. Um, they also need a heating lamp. And this heating lamp provides a basking area, which should be kept around um, 88 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They will bathe in that. They really enjoy a lot. But they should also have a cool side. This cool side allows them to calm down, cool down, and that should be kept at about 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so the humidity should be kept about 20 to 40 degree percent. And this should be um, kept track of with a hum um, humidifier and its measuring levels. So a bearded dragon should be fed like insects such as like crickets and mealworms, and it should be supplemented with leafy greens every once in a while. Um, a really good substrate to keep for this enclosure is AstroTurf. Um, this allows for very easy cleanup. You can get it um, fit to the size of your cage. Um, an example of the closure is seen on the right. It's gonna be kind of like a normal set of enclosures. You can have other reptiles nearby, but they can't interact with each other. And this allows for like easy viewing um, and signage would be shown in the middle. And then another um, reptile I'm gonna talk about is the leopard gecko. 
So the leopard gecko will also be in a four by two by two. Um, this animal can live with other leopard geckos, but only females should be live together. Um, males will fight if they're together and you probably don't want a breeding pair together. Um, so these will also be in glass enclosures in the same kind of closure as the bearded dragon. Um, this is also gonna be have hides um, and climbing structures, they love to climb. They should have a heat lamp. Um, also should have a UVB lamp light. Um, this UVB light allows them to uh, absorb calcium and vitamin C in their bodies, in their diets. So this UVB lamp should be turned off at night um, because leopard geckos are nocturnal and so they're most active at night and they really don't need it at that time. Um, with the heat lamp, the basking sh um, spot should be about 88 degrees Fahrenheit and the cooler side should be about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Leopard geckos are very sensitive to drafts and like breezes, so they should be away from like air vents and windows. Um, so the humidity should be kept about 30 to 40 percent. Um, with their feed, they can be given crickets and mealworms um, switched out like every day, other day, like just like the bearded dragon. They can also be giving wax worms for treats, but since these are so high in fat, they should only be given like once a week. Um, so the crickets and mealworms should be gut loaded. And what this means is that they should be, there's a special powder that you um, basically just feed them and you feed them like all these nutrients and it allows them to get like a bunch of these nutrients in the feed. And then once the leopard gecko eats them, it absorbs those nutrients at the Crickets eight. Um, so the substrate, it's best just to do like pre-packaged bedding. Um, sand is not a good idea with these. They can get impactations like very easily. Um, it, and especially with like the young, they tend to eat it a lot. Also what's unique about these guys is that you can actually, um, they actually go to the bathroom in one spot. So that makes cleaning very easy. And a technique that you can use with them is um, you put a slate rock or some kind of rock in the corner where they tend to go to the bathroom. And this allows for easy cleaning as um, like every day you can take out the rock and just like wipe it down and clean it. And that allows for a cleaner um, environment for them. Um, so next reptile is the ball python. Um, this closure is me four by two by two, which is a little bit taller. Um, and so with ball pythons, they will also have like a glass enclosure and climbing structures. This is very important for them. They need to have like plants and wood to climb and just bask on. Um, the temperature of it should be about 90 to 94 degrees. Um, and have a cool side about 75 to 80. With this in structure, it will be kind of faced away from the small mammals. And this is um, because they are a predator species. And so by facing them away, it kind of takes away the stress of the small mammals. So they don't feel like they're constantly being preyed on. Um, the humidity should be kept about 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, this, oh, a little bit higher and then so the feed is frozen and thawed small rodents some of these are very very picky eaters and um uh, will not eat um like frozen so you have to actually give them live until you're able to switch in them to frozen um a substrate that works good for this is cypress moss mulch but they can also use um paper towels um so another reptile is the red ears slider so these, this can have a really unique um, home. So I made it like a hexagon shape. You can get these made. And it's about 10 square feet um, total. It's glass sides. So this allows viewing in five of the sides. So it's more interactive, but at the same time, it provides good enclosure for them where they feel safe. So one of the sides will have a floating dock and a heat lamp. And this allows the um, turtles to be up on land. 
and the water depth would be about a foot. So the water temp should be kept at 74 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit, while the basking rock underneath the heat lamp should be between 90 and 95. So these turtles are fed commercial food, but they can also be supplemented with leafy greens and be treated with minnows, worms, and crickets. Hi, I'm Anna, and I will be talking about the small mammal section at Petco. Um, as an overview, this section is going to be about 200 square feet total, and it's going to be located in the animal-only gated section. And ideally, this section will be only for people looking at the pets. If they come in with pets that they already have, such as dogs or cats, ideally, they will not be allowed in this section, which will reduce stress for the animals in this section and it will reduce scents that can cause um, fear in these animals since they are prey species, most of them. And then the, decreasing the unwanted animal interactions, such as like a dog coming up and smelling the tanks will be overall optimal for the animal welfare. And then it'll also be quieter as a whole in this section away from the rest of the store, which will cause the animal, will, which will allow the animals to relax more. And as mentioned before, the animal section, the animal only section is going to be along the right side of the store, opposite the store entrance to decrease the likelihood of drafts and such like that. And then the small mammal section in particular will be located between the reptile and bird sections. And on this slide, I have like a diagram of what the small mammal section as a whole will look like. So the gerbils and the hamsters will be in a section that's seven foot by two and a half foot. The ferrets will be in a four foot by five foot enclosure. And then the guinea pigs will be in a three foot by four foot enclosure. And I'll discuss more about those on the following slides. And then the lighting for this section as a whole is gonna be yellow toned as mentioned before, ideally around 2,700 Kelvin too, because this is um, a lo lower toned lighting, which will be more relaxing to the animals than fluorescent lights. And then overall, an overview for the gerbils and hamsters. They will be housed in plexiglass and or acrylic aquariums with wire mesh lids. And then the, light, the wire mesh lids allows for ventilation that is lost due to having solid walls. And then the reason why plexiglass is chosen instead of glass is because overall it is more durable and lightweight. So it reduces the chance of shattering in case of an accident. And then since there's going to be a lot of aquarium stack in one area. That's a lot of weight to have over one floor. So being lightweight is essential, especially for transporting the aquariums. When cleaning and getting the animals out, you wanna be able to do that easily and not have them too heavy. And then aquariums as well are easily sanitized. You can wipe down the sides with animal friendly cleaner a lot easier than you would with wire. And then this also increases the safety for both public and animals inside the aquariums. Since there's no wires available, the public is unable to stick their fingers in, such as small children especially are used, may wanna do that, may wanna touch the animals and that could create an issue if the animal tries to bite them or something like that. So that reduces that completely. And then if the public wants to touch the animals, they will need employee supervision permission to do so. And then this also increases safety for the animals themselves as they will not be able to squeeze through the wire bars of a wire cage Instead, they will just be in the aquarium and then the lids of the aquariums will be clamped down on at least two sides with um, clamps so the animals are not able to climb up onto something and kind of push it off. So that increases the safety overall for those as well. And then glass sides or plexiglass sides allows for optimal viewing to the public. So the public is able to see the animals and kind of interact with them without actually touching them. And then, like I mentioned, air ventilation is through the wire mesh lid. And so for the gerbils and hamsters, they will be on a um, seven foot long shelf that is double sided. It is a metal rack. And since it is double sided, that allows for cages to be on each side of the shelf. So it allows you to optimize the amount of space available. And this is gonna be along the far right of the store like shown in the diagram previously. And then there's gonna be, an, since there are five shelves, there will be gerbils housed on the top two shelves because they are not nocturnal. 
So they would be, they would fare better being closer to a light source than the hamsters, which are nocturnal. It would be better to be further away from the light source. And then, so this shelf, this metal rack will be approximately six feet tall. It'll be 75 inches tall. And then with each shelf, since there are gerbils on the top two shelves, there will be three tanks on the gerbil shelves and then four tanks on the hamster shelves, which I will go into more on the next slide. So for the gerbils specifically, they will be housed in 15 gallon aquariums. Um, these will be 24 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. And like I said, on the top two shelves of the metal rack and this having three cages per shelf. And then in each cage, you will have four gerbils total, which gives each gerbil approximately five gallons of space to themselves, which allows them to kind of have their own space if they want, not be around the other ones and kind of do their own thing. And then the elements of each, uh, each enclosure is that they will have a glass water bottle with a stainless steel sipper. And this is to allow for easier refreshment and just overall easier sanitation because water bottles are, do not need to be as fresh as, refreshed as often as a water bowl would be. And then it also eliminates the possibility of drowning. And then these water bottles will also be enclosed in a metal chew guard as gerbils are known NARS and they will try to bite on many things and then that can cause issues in case of ingestion. So the metal chew guard will reduce them from biting on the water bottle and causing issues that way. And then in the enclosure, there will be a ceramic food bowl. And the reason for ceramic instead of plastic is again, in the instance of chewing and ceramic is typically heavier, which will decrease the possibility of it getting dumped rather than like a plastic dish or something around the cage. And the diet that will be provided will be a gerbil pelleted diet, just kind of like a basic commercial one, but it would be smart to have it uh, supplemented with fresh fruits and vegetables and mixed seeds just to make sure that these gerbils get um, a nutritional balanced diet. And this should be available all day free feeding and it should be replaced each morning. And then for enrichment, there should be a plastic wheel, which will allow for exercise. And the reason why I pick plastic instead of wire is because although plastic can be chewed, it does not have any open spaces for their feet to get caught. So it is safer for the gerbils in general, and it is easier to sanitize. And then there will also be a ceramic dish, another ceramic dish available in the gerbil section that will contain chinchilla sand, which will allow for sand bathing which is how the gerbils kind of get clean the oil off their coats and just kind of keep themselves clean. And having that will be essential to the welfare of the animal and keeping them having natural behaviors in the space. And then also in each enclosure, there should be some chewing blocks as gerbils teeth grow continuously and they will like to gnaw on these things. And the more chewing, the more um, optimal chewing blocks and hides and stuff, that they are able to chew on that are safe to chew on will decrease the likelihood of them chewing on things such as the plastic wheel. And there should also be a log bridge and a plastic tunnel. And additionally, you can also use cardboard um, toilet paper tubes. These are, as, there, as long as there is no glue on these, these are safe for the gerbils to kind of gnaw on and play with. And the good thing about toilet paper tubes is they are cheap and then they do not need to be cleaned. They can just kind of be disposed of when they are ruined and that you can just replace them. And as well in this enclosure for the gerbils, there should be one, one non-toxic wooden hide per two gerbils. So if there's gonna be four gerbils in a cage, there should be two wooden hides. And this will allow for each gerbil to have a place to kind of return to. This also includes like the wooden tunnels there's multiple places for them to hide if they so desire to. And then the existence of these as well as the wooden tunnels allows them to kind of jump and climb and, ex and express those natural behaviors. And then the, the bedding should be paper-based and it can be um, pre-packaged as long as it's gerbil safe. And it should be optimally, optimally four inches deep as gerbils are natural burrowers. And this will allow them to engage in that behavior. And then next for the hamsters, we will, I'm only gonna be speaking about Syrian hamsters today. 
and these hamsters will be placed in the three shelves below the gerbils, as mentioned before, as they are nocturnal. And then for each hamster, it will be a 10 gallon aquarium, which is about 20 inches by 10 inches by 12 inches. And ideally they will, there will be four of these aquariums per shelf. And in each aquarium, there will only be one hamster. And this is because these Syrian hamsters are known to display aggression. So we, they are solitary animals and would like to be housed as such. And then to decrease this aggression as well, there should be opaque dividers between each cage so that the hamsters are unable to see each other and then thus hopefully decrease the stress that they may feel about being in captivity. And then as like mentioned for the gerbils, they will also have glass um, water bottles with metal chew guard and a ceramic food bowl. And then this food should be a pelleted diet that is supplemented with fresh fruits and vegetables as well. And the occasional alfalfa cube, which should be available all day. And this is to in, make sure that they have a balanced diet. And then in each cage, there should be one plastic wheel for, to allow for exercise as well. And then at least one non-toxic wood chewing block, a log bridge or tunnel to allow them to hide or climb upon. Cardboard toilet paper tubes as well just to kind of give them multiple things to play with or enrich their life and captivity as much as possible. And their bedding should be about four inches deep as well to allow them to burrow and kind of move around if they so desire. For the guinea pigs, they will be in a three foot by four foot by two foot high plexiglass enclosure. And this will have a wire mesh lid, like I said before for the gerbils and hamsters. And ideally, this enclosure will be raised about two and a half feet above the floor. This will allow for optimal viewing by the public. And then the use of plexiglass is ease of sanitation and public safety, as mentioned before. And ideally, this enclosure would only house four guinea pigs to allow them each to have enough space and ability to engage in natural behaviors as much as possible while not being crowded. Um, each enclosure will also make use of a glass water bottle with a metal chew guard as their teeth grow continuously as well and they will like to chew on multiple things so to reduce that the chew guard will be there and since there will be four guinea pigs in the enclosure ideally there will be two ceramic food bowls instead of just one which will have a guinea pig pelleted diet and this should be supplemented with grass hay as well as fresh fruits and vegetables and since guinea pigs have a vitamin C requirement and they cannot make it themselves, it is essential to make sure that they get enough in their diet. So providing the fresh um, vegetables and the leafy greens will make sure that they get that, that vitamin C in their diet. And like mentioned before, this should be available all day. And then in, each, in the guinea pig enclosure, there should be two large non-toxic wooden tunnels and then two large plastic hides. And since guinea pigs are prey animals and they tend to want to hide, this will give them all the opportunities to do so if they so desire and therefore reduce stress from being in captivity and being around people such as that. And then each guinea pig should also have at least one willow ball that they can use to play around and gnaw on. And there should be two cut logs. They could be either real logs that are sanitized and made safe for the guinea pigs or May, or like toys that are um, commercially produced that can be placed in the middle of the enclosure. And these logs would allow for climbing if the guinea pigs wanna climb up on them. And it can also allow for placing grass hay on top of, which can allow the guinea pigs to kind of engage in foraging behavior as it makes it a little bit more difficult to get to the food rather than just kind of going to a food dish and eating like that. And they need um, chew sticks available in their environment as well to reduce the chewing on plastic, but allow them to keep their teeth shaved down. And then for the ferrets, they will be housed in a plexiglass enclosure as well. And this will be four foot by five foot by two and a half feet tall. And the wire mesh lid allows for ventilation as well, but the lid should be clamped down as ferrets can be can easily escape. So clamping those down ensures that that will not happen and that that will be safely in the um, enclosure. And ideally, this one will be raised two and a half feet above the ground as well to allow for optimal viewing, as mentioned, for the guinea pigs. And then the plexiglass is allowing for ease of sanitation and public safety. 
And then this enclosure should house four ferrets. And then the elements of this enclosure is to have one detachable plastic shelf raised one and a half feet up in one of the corners of the enclosure. And there should be a solid plastic ramp leading up to it. And then ideally these will be covered in machine washable fleece. Um, this will reduce chewing on the plastic and then having the use of machine washable fleece makes it easily to take it out and clean it whenever needed. And the use of the shelf is to allow, kind of give, to kind of give extra room for the ferrets to kind of run around and play versus being in like just one single level enclosure. It kind of gives them more space to kind of go around and engage in play behavior or just to kind of get away from the other ferrets if they so desire. Um, there should also be two machine washable hammocks that will be attached to the lid of the enclosure to increase the places for them to sleep, to be comfortable, kind of to hide and just kind of add an extra level to the enclosure kind of such as the shelf. And then ferrets can also, also use litter boxes. So there should be two thick plastic litter boxes available that should contain ferret safe litter. So that means kind of like low dust and an example of that could be recycled paper. And these should be ideally in the corners of the cage and one side of the plastic litter box should be pretty low as so they ferrets can easily enter and leave and it makes them more likely to use the litter box versus just kind of going to a random section of the cage. And then for the ferrets, there should be two ceramic food bowls available as well. And there's that can be filled with a commercial ferret diet and should be available all day. They will also have a glass water bottle with the chew guard and they should also have inside the enclosure five um, hard plastic balls with bells and sides that the ferrets are able to play with and kind of run around with, as well as two durable plastic tunnels and ferrets like to naturally burrow in tunnels. So giving them these tunnels in the enclosure will allow them to demonstrate that behavior and, allow the, and it will allow the public as well to see them demonstrate that behavior and see them play, which might lead to them going home with more people seeing how that the ferrets, as the public can see how fun ferrets can be as pets. And then occasionally paper bags can be placed inside the enclosure as well. And then there should be two large plastic igloo hides to allow for sleeping or just whatever the ferrets wanna use them for. And then their bedding should be about three to four inches deep and should be recycled paper as well. And then signage in this section, they should be large print and easily readable signs beside each of the enclosures so the owners can easily see what the requirements are for the animals and know if they were to take one home, what should be done. So it should contain important information for the owner to know, and that can include lifespan, whether the animal should be housed separately or together as a group, um, the estimated adult size, as well as their most active time of day, like if they're nocturnal, so the owner should be aware of that. And then it should also contain notable species considerations, like for hamsters, guinea pigs, and gerbils, that their teeth continuously grow. Therefore, they need to have enough um, things for the, them to gnaw on appropriately that doesn't cause accidental ingestion of like plastic. So they would need something like such as wood that is safe for them to gnaw on. And I have an example of a sign for a Syrian hamster, and it talks about how their life is about one to three years. They're solitary. And then it also lets the owner know as well that they require safe gnawing materials and that they also kind of scare easily. So which should let them know that you need to be careful when picking them up. So to reduce the possibility of getting bitten. And then the sanitation protocol for this section is to, for the water bottles, those will be refreshed every other day and the food should be replenished, replenished each morning. And then for the sanitizer, sanitization of the enclosure itself um, weekly. Ideally, they would clean, employees would clean the enclosures weekly with animal friendly disinfectant. And what that includes is taking everything out of the enclosure, sanitizing everything, inspecting it to make sure that there's nothing that needs to be replaced. Um, and this can be done as needed as well. If it needs to be done more than once a week, that is the best thing that should be done, especially for the ferrets as they have a natural musky odor. They're, enclosure will likely need to be cleaned more often, especially um, machine washable covers for the ramps and like the hammocks. And during the cleaning process, all bedding should be replaced. And like I said, everything should be inspected carefully for hazards to make sure that there's no accidental ingestion or 
places that could harm the animals. Um, yeah. Hi there, I'm Abigail and I will be covering the fish in this section. Um, we had sectioned off 250 square feet for the fish, just since they have a lot of supplies that go towards them, a lot more than people may realize. And um, we would appreciate that they are located in the furthest corner of the store, just to keep them further away. They, many of them are temperament or temperatures, um, kind of, um, they're really temperament with the temperature of their tanks and keeping them further away from the door allows the heaters to do their job and not kind of um, change those waters for them. So a um, basic of the fish, um, there is two different types of tanks that could be used for fish. Um, there's glass and plexiglass tanks. Glass is more affordable as that's the typical tank that many people get. They are scratch resistant and they don't yellow over time. Plexiglass is a little bit more expensive as it's not readily used. It's usually used for massive tanks about 200 gallons or so. It is easily scratched, so it's kind of harder to clean. It's hard to disinfect between fish and it does yellow over time. So it would be beneficial to use glass tanks and displays. Um, size wise, it should be about 20 gallons per species that you sell to prevent many of the overcrowding that you see. It's not gonna stop all of it as you do need to keep supply of the fish, but it would allow less stress in the tanks. Um, many of the fish need filters and some need heaters. The fish that need heaters are usually your tropical fish. Um, they should be kind of segregated almost to keep the tropical fish on one side, the other fish on the other that way we're not having issues with the ones that like the cooler temperature being in between two heated tanks and heating up their water. And all of the fish should be quarantined before adding them to current fish on display to prevent the spread of disease. Another thing you could do is have two tanks dedicated to do different or to the same species. This could allow for um, in case one side gets a disease, you still have fish available to sell that aren't disease ridden. And um, larger care sheets for the species should be sold to promote proper care of fish and to ensure that the fish that need schools are not sold alone unless they're being added to an existing school. Um, most of the signage you see right now are all small lettering. Most people can't read that or don't really see the lettering and just kind of choose to ignore it. So something bigger that kind of catches the eye to draw the attention to it might be best. And fish usually need lighting that copies a natural day cycle. So 12 hours of light and then 12 hours of darkness. That way it, it's kind of like us. It, they just need that shut off time and having light 24 seven does cause stress. So the first fish that I'm gonna talk about um, are beta fish for their water parameters. Like all fish, that I'm gonna talk about. They all need pH is about seven. Hardness of water is usually about three to 10. For betas, it stops at four. Ammonium and nitrates and nitrites should be zero. Nitrates usually can fluctuate between the different fish, but usually should try to be kept around zero. But for betas, the temperature needs to be around 75 to 81 degrees Fahrenheit. That's gonna be harder to control in the store, but it would be good knowledge to have for employees to tell customers that way they you know where to buy a heater with them and that they're not keeping them in colder temperatures. Uh, for housing for betas, males cannot be housed with other ma males of the species and they can't be housed with other flashy fish. They do get really um, territorial with where they're at, so it's not really a good idea. Maybe adding like fast fish that they can't catch because they are a little bit more lazier. And then females can be housed together in a sorority. It's kind of harder to start, maybe not for beginners as they need about four or more to start it. And you do have to monitor them a lot to make sure that there's no fighting between them. And that way you have sources to also remove the bullied one. And they can be they can be housed with the faster fishes as well, 
but you shouldn't house them with fish larger than them or flashier than them as they get a little bit more territorial as well. Both, however, should be housed in a 10 gallon tank minimum if they're housed with other fish. If you're just holding one male with no other fish, it's fine to have them in about a five gallon, but that's the bare minimum that they can be housed in. And like I said, they need faster fish tank mates if that's the plan for them. They need plenty of hides, especially if there are other tank mates. That way they can hide, remove themselves from the view of other fish and also hide the other fish from them. It just kind of brings down their stress levels. And it is recommended that live plants be housed with these guys just since plastics can tear their fins. It's not gonna be fun to try to help heal that up. So it's possible, but could be recommended with live um, in store. There should be dividers in between the individual cups, which at Petco, it seems like they already do that, which is awesome because that prevents the stress, especially between the males. Um, that way they're not constantly flashing at the other males or trying to fight them between the cups. And because they are in such little cups, they should have daily water changes just to remove all the ammonium that they will produce by the end of the day all like the leftover food that they may have and stuff like that. They are carnivores, so they need a high protein pelleted food, usually about over 40%. And they can use freeze dried blood, um, blood worms as treats and stuff. And then the next fish that I will be talking about is neon tetra fish. Um, like I said, pH hardness and ammonium are usually about the same. The temperature for these guys are about 72 to 76 degrees Fahrenheit. So they will also require that heater. Housing, uh, they should be housed in a 20 gallon tank minimum. Uh, bigger tanks are best though, because they are easier to clean. They're not gonna get dirty as quickly with all the ammonium built up between all the fish in the tank because they do require about a school of 10 to 15 at minimum. They do do best in well-decorated tanks so that they have places to go explore and hide around and stuff like that. They should not be housed with betas because they, um, and other slow moving aggressive fish as they will nip at the fins of the slow moving fish. And they could be also harmed and eaten by the aggressive fish. And um, also if you see one of these guys on their own away from the school, it's typically because they are ill and they should be immediately removed and held for op um, observation just to make sure they aren't um, with disease or anything like that. They are omnivorous, so brine shrimp and small blood worms are great. There are pelleted foods and flake foods that are designed for tropical fish that work. And then next are molly fish. Um, they are, they should be housed about 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And their housing, they should be housed in groups of three or more, 10 gallons at minimum for a group of three and should not be housed with aggressive fish larger than them. So if you're going to try to house them with betas, which is okay, they should be about the same size and maybe not as flashy as the betas. And they are omnivorous. So they can eat live blood worms and love to snack on vegetables like peas and cucumbers, which could be a great enrichment for them and just a little tree here and there with water changes and stuff like that. And then finally, we have guppy fish. Um, they should be housed at about 72 to 82 degrees. Um, Typically, guppies, since they are so small, they should have about one gallon per fish, but that should be started at five gallons just so that they have enough room to swim around and stuff. And they should be housed in groups of three or more with a ratio of two to one, male to female, just to keep um, temperaments down. And they are very prolific. So it you could start with three and two weeks later, you could have about 25 of them. It's just, they are very fast breeding. So it might be best to have less females or at least watch for them. If you're going to show, um, house them just for show, it might be best to just do males. So you're not having an abundance of little guppies floating around. They are omnivorous. So they should be fed a mix of live and processed foods just because the live foods don't have enough nutrients for them. And I do love veggies like tomatoes, spinach, and lettuce, which is another great enrichment like the molly fish that they can just go around and mess around with. And that is it. Okay, so I'm gonna stop recording.